Uh, let's get into the big story. It is the results from the weekend that was in the Big Ten. Among the headlines, Penn State handing Auburn its largest non-conference home loss since 1982. Michigan, Ohio State, Minnesota, and Wisconsin cruising past some lesser opponents, while MSU, Nebraska, and Purdue all fell to Power Five foes. Close wins for Maryland, Rutgers, Indiana. I think we have to start with Penn State. Uh, this was not a vintage Auburn team, and I do think we need to put that out on the table. But you are still on the road in SEC country against a team that felt pretty good about its defense, particularly up front coming into this game. You ran all over them. You win in a hostile environment. You don't just win, but again, largest home loss for them in a non-conference game in 40 years. I think this is significant. Massive. Um, I think it's absolutely the right point to start the show because that, this is a big win. And, you know, we love to talk about conference supremacy this time of year. Um, but but I think to your point about this is a program we have said for how long can they run the ball? Can they run the ball? Yeah. Do they have an explosive running back since Saquon Barkley? Yeah, the answer is yes in, in Nick Singleton. And I also thought, too, you know, areas that they really impressed were – when Auburn was in the red zone. Now, again, Auburn's got a lot of issues. Tank Bigsby is trying to do it all by himself, but they held them to six points on four red zone trips. I mean, there was just so much that you can point to in this game if you're a Penn State fan and be excited about. I think it changes the trajectory of the season, how you feel about the season, yeah. what you just saw at Auburn. This is what I really like about it. I think when you talk about going into this hostile environment and you come out of there with a win, regardless of how good Auburn is, that environment doesn't change. Whether right. they're a great team or an average team. And they prepared for that. And for me, when I watched this defense run sideline to sideline, I was really impressed. What Manny Diaz has done in, in putting his system in, in place, the, the players are really you know, responding to it because they looked fast. You could really tell the job they've been rec doing, recruiting on that side of the football. They have some outstanding players there, and, and they showed up in one of the biggest moments they needed to, which was in it during this game. Incredibly disruptive in this game, right? I mean, they gave up some yards, but the turnovers, the tackles for losses, the sacks, like when they needed to come up with big plays, they did. And I just think you can't overstate the Singleton part of yeah. it and the run game, right? I mean, he has five carries of so 40 yards or longer. Not only is that the most in the nation, it's the most in the nation – by three. Right. I mean, he, that's a, he is a difference maker for a team that could not run the ball out. And we talked about them being able to run the ball, whether it was, you know, you, you take out the big explosive run plays. Would they be able to run it for four and four and a half, five yards a carry? And I don't think that's necessarily going to change. But now when you have a guy there that can hit the home run, can catch the ball out of the backfield, and it's just not him. They have a stable of backs that can help them yep. move, move in this direction. This is what they needed to be able to have those explosive plays to take the pressure off the pass game because there's a lot of pressure there. And, you know, I, I really like what they're doing on, in all phases of the game right now. Well, and, and I, I don't think that we can talk more about enough about that, about what Sean Clifford's been facing when you have a one-dimensional offense yeah. and there is all of that pressure on you, and especially if you're not able to run it between the tackles and then you can't get those explosive yeah. plays, that is all on the pass game. And so it really does change some things. Again, I just feel like you've got to feel totally different about Penn State coming out of a performance like this, not just a win, but the way that they want it. And honestly, I feel a little bit different than I did coming out of the Purdue game. The Purdue game was a very impressive win. Like, do not yes. get us wrong, right? Really impressive. Also a very hostile atmosphere. But they didn't run it great in that game. They showed some signs. But what they did here over the last couple of weeks, and Ohio used one thing, but to do it against Auburn, it's for real. There are not that many teams in the Big Ten or nationally that we know a lot about because we haven't seen them in these types of environments. Penn State's been in two. And yes, they've, and, they've, and they've passed with flying them. colors. Yeah. yeah, a real quick comment here, though. Now I'm going to move the bar for Penn State. Right? Okay. Don't have letdowns. You need to play like this every week because you know you have the talent there that can make it happen. We need to see this each and every week that they play. First chance to avoid a letdown Central Michigan this week here on go. the Big Ten Network. <laughs> so we'll see how they perform there. Ohio State, they pummeled Toledo. They scored touchdowns in their first seven possessions. What did you take from it? To me, again, this is an offense that's continuing to play well. Uh, they were able to get some pieces back to really help them out. They continue to go deep in that running back room. Uh, Coach Alfred believes it's probably the best running back room he's had, he's been a part of, to have a chance to coach. 
So they're continuing to get better. And, and C.J. Stroud just continues to look like the elite quarterback that, that he has turned into. Uh, defensively, yeah, they give up some plays, but, you know, we still don't know, right? They still haven't necessarily faced that quarterback that's really going to put a lot of stress and put them in difficult situations. So to me, the plan is continuing to go as <laughs> what we expect to happen. We just need to see the next opportunity that they have. We've been saying this all along. There weren't going to be that many games and that many moments that we learn about mm -hmm. those steps defensively, and, and we really haven't seen them. I mean, we saw something in the Notre Dame game, but we're still waiting. I think offensively it was great to see C.J. Stroud look like he did a lot last year mm -hmm. and to have his full complement of receivers back as they worked more guys in. A lot of guys had catches, touchdowns. I mean, it's just that that is the passing offense that we thought we were going to see this year, and we're really seeing it. I've turned into an explosive team again. We talked in that. Notre Dame game that they didn't have the big plays, just one over 30 yards. Mm -hmm. They now have 15 plays of 30 yards or longer, which is the most in the nation. Right. And again, just one against the Irish. And so much of that had to do with the way the Irish decided to play them. Yes. They were going to play back and not give up the big stuff they gave up the underneath. So they took exactly what the defense right. gave them. But again, one of the things that I've been focused on when you talk about these elite teams in Ohio State and Michigan is getting to that point as well, that they're playing so many players. And, and I can't the, – the value of having so many players have the chance to play and prove to their teammates and the coaching staff that when I'm put in a tough situation, you'll be able to count on me is something that as we continue to go throughout the season, is really going to pay dividends. You know what else was fun? I formation. There were seven plays, three touchdowns out of the I formation. Ryan Day said it was something, a package that they are working out. I mean, I think a lot of people got to chuckle out of that. Well, if we like running the football, we'll get some of that this week because they play Wisconsin. I will obviously spend a ton of time on this game this week, but kind of first blush, what you're thinking, Buckeyes and Badgers. I think it's an interesting, interesting matchup. We're going to learn about that defense going up against a good run game and a Graham Mertz, who has been improved, who is coming into this game with a lot of confidence. Um, but, you know, the question is going to be, can Wisconsin – hold serve. I yeah. mean, they're they're going to have to put up some. Yeah, points. I think this offensive line for Wisconsin is going to have to do a great job of blocking the defensive line of Ohio State. Uh, you know, Michael Hall Jr. didn't play last right. week. They rested him up. He is a dynamic pass rusher from that that two, three position inside. They're going to have to find a way to neutralize him and hope that they don't get a lot of pressure off the edge. Well, we'll get to Wisconsin in a bit, but Ohio State Essentially unbeatable at home in situations like this. 25 straight conference road wins. That is the longest streak in Big Ten history. Michigan annihilates UConn. I again, it is tough to read too much into this, given the caliber of the competition. And, and that's been the story for Michigan so far. But, man, they have done what you would expect them to do against inferior teams. I think this is what you have to do and what you want to do if they struggle any bit. I mean, people get concerned, but they, they're, they're coming out early. They're putting these games away early. They look good on both sides. Um, you have Blake Corum, obviously, yeah. fantastic. Barely any touches, five <laughs> touchdowns. I mean, that's that's the kind of efficiency you yeah. really want out of a running back. But I, I just think, you know, they can't control their schedule. Um, the players on this team can't control that this was what was given to them. We've talked a lot about maybe this schedule actually allowed the J.J. McCarthy transition mm -hmm. to happen in the first place. But all you can really do coming out of this is say, okay, we've got confidence. We've worked in a bunch of players, mm -hmm. to your point. And that's all we can do. I mean, you, you can't control the level of the competition. So I think, you know, it's obviously going to take a big step up, but yeah. all they could really do is what they did. Yeah, and, and that's what they're doing. And, and we talked about J.J. being placed in positions where he has to really make good, some good decisions. There were some shots in this game when I went back and watched it where he may have made the wrong read, and he mm -hmm. knew it immediately that I should have made a different read. So being able to have those type of situations are going to be important for his growth as they go down the line. But I think it was also telling – when Blake Quorum at the end during his press conference, when asked how good they are, he flat out said, I don't know. I I just, that was great. I, right. I just don't know because of what we played. I think we're really good, but I don't know. We're going to find out. And they've got the pieces there. And I, I just like the way this team is moving right that now. That was one of the best and smartest comments we've heard by anyone all season. It was so self-aware and exactly what you'd want to hear if you're that coaching staff. We start finding out against Maryland this week. Certainly Maryland will – one would think, challenge their defense, given yep. how good Maryland is offensively. Again, plenty of time to dissect this one this week, but first thoughts. Definitely more of a challenge, possibly a shootout. Um, you know, we saw a lot from Maryland's defense at the end of that SMU game, but 
you know, overall, they're, they're not one of the better uh, total defenses, pass defenses in the league. So there should be opportunities for J.J. But this is a step up. I mean, this is what they need. They need to work their way into a test. It's not Kinnick. That's yes. going to be the big one. Yep. But I do think, you know, if they need to score, if they get in a shootout, if they do all these things, they need to learn how to win that game. Right. And, again, going back to J.J. for real quickly in the pass game, he looks real comfortable back there. And this offensive line has given him all the time in the world. So unless Maryland is going to be able to put him in, in some duress type situations, he's going to be able to make plays. So to me, just first glance, Maryland's defensive line and front seven is going to be, have to be a big part of that. They have to be disruptive because if they are able to just sit back and do whatever they want to in the pass game, this is going to be a long day because they're going to move the ball down the field. And it's going to have a lot to do with the run game to really keep that offense on the sideline because you know how explosive Maryland is offensively. Well, Michigan's explosive themselves, better than 55 yeah. points per game. They are leading the nation in scoring three games in. Today's big stat brought to you by Gatorade. Actually, a collection of stats showing you just how good Minnesota has been. Three straight wins by 38 or more points. That is the first time since 17. 1917. You see the historic numbers for scoring offense and scoring defense. The Gophers second in the nation in scoring differential. They lead the nation in yards differential, outgaining their opponents by more than 384 yards per game. Which gets us to our big interview, and as you may have gleaned, it is Gophers coach P.J. Fleck who is joining us. P.J., awfully impressive. How has the start compared to your expectations for this team coming into the year? Well, we have high expectations for this football team, and I've said all along since January, this is a really fun team to coach because whatever you put in front of them, they just run right through it, uh, and they all know why. It's a really smart team. They know when to concentrate. They got incredible focus. They're really good people. And if you got a bunch of really good people on a team, uh, they can make themselves really good players. And, and that's what this team's really dedicated themselves to is, is all the unrequired work. And, and listen, we're zero and zero. We know that. And uh, we got a tough matchup against Sparty out in East Lansing. And, you know, they're focused on that and that alone. And we'll get into the Michigan State game here in a bit. I, I do want to ask you, We've talked a lot about this in the context of you guys, and you may have even heard us talking about it in the context of Michigan. You haven't played a great schedule to this point. When you schedule a team like Colorado, you obviously assume that you're going to get a really good game. And as it turns out, they have just fallen on some hard times here. How much does it concern you as you head into a game like Michigan State that you haven't played a team of that caliber, again, largely through no fault of your own? Well, I think you all hit it in, the, in the, the broadcast right before the interview. I think you hit it right on the head. It, what people don't really, really realize is that scheduling's done 10, 12, 15, 20 years in advance. Yeah. Uh, we're scheduling games right now for 2030, 2035, 2034. I mean, I'm not sure if I'll even be alive then, let alone schedule teams like that. You, you have no idea, right? So um, especially when you there, there's, there's former staffs and administrations that created staffs. Listen. Our players play the schedule that's on paper, period. And you've got to do your part, make sure your team's really prepared no matter who you play. And uh, that's what this team does really well. No matter who we play, we've got to be at our best. We can't worry about our opponent. We never can control our opponent. So the only thing you can control is you. And, um, you know, they've done a really good job with that in the first three games and have another challenge this week. A lot was made before this season, the return of Kirk Shiraka as your offensive coordinator and early returns are great. We talk about a lot in the context of Tanner Morgan and you're up 50 spots in passing efficiency from where you were a year ago. How in particular has that combination and the reunion of those two impacted Tanner? Well, it's truly a relationship and it's truly based on trust and that time um, and that consistency and that proof build that trust. And Kirk and, and Tanner have that together, and they kind of picked up where they left off. And that's a credit to both of them yeah, because it takes a, a tremendous amount uh, of trust in one another. Uh, but when you look at it, I mean, Tanner's really poised in the pocket. He's confident. He's got a ton of experience, and I think that's what you're seeing on the field. Uh, Kirk's doing the things that he does really well, putting him in positions to be successful. And Tanner's really doing all the unrequired work necessary uh, to make sure that he has that mastery and that control, that game plan in, 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 in specific for that particular week. Uh, but I love the way that the relationship
relationship is and always has been because that is one of the most report, important relationships in sports, taking the head coach out of it between the offensive coordinator and that, and that quarterback. You got a running back who's tearing it up as well, Muhammad Ibrahim, and it's really an amazing story. That last touchdown run was a thing of beauty, but I mean, here's a guy who a year ago is rehabbing a torn Achilles and now has the longest streak of 100 yard rushing games in school history, longest active streak in the FBS, has every bit, it appears, of the explosion that he had prior to his injury. What has it meant to you to see him come back and play as well as he has? Well, it's like that, that movie Rookie of the Year, you know, when they fix his arm and he actually gets faster and the ball comes out faster. You got a little kid pitching 100 miles an hour, whatever it is. Uh, I, I would say this, that, that one run that you're actually talking about, I think that exemplifies what gopher football is all about, pushing the pile, mo breaking tackles, running the football, playing tough football, uh, situational football. But, uh, you know, Mo understands the better the team does, the more individual accolades people get. There, there's not a, a more selfless player maybe in college football. Uh, and with all due respect, I don't know anybody uh, besides my team, but I'll tell you this, that he is one of the most selfless people in all of college football, and it shows in his game. It shows the type of person he is off the field, how he used to share all his NIL money. And I said used to because he kind of put all that stuff aside to focus on this whole year of being healthy, um, making sure his internal message was way louder than the external message. And, and that's what he's done. He's a special human being. Uh, when I say special, I mean that is – the best compliment I can give him as a person and as a player. And I'm just very, very blessed and grateful and, and humbled that he's on our team. One tough piece of news you did announce this morning that Chris Ottman Bell is out for the year with a lower leg injury. I think we all kind of suspected that when we saw his injury on Saturday and heard your postgame comments as well. What can you tell us there? Yeah, well, first of all, I mean, and Chris's response is incredible. I mean, he's one of the most positive guys in the locker room. Uh, you, he's overcome a ton of adversity already. You know, we've already, or we're in the process of filing that, that seven-year waiver, which hopefully will be passed by the NCAA. That's the right thing to do. It's, it's all, the, all the legality fits. It's just well, whether Chris is willing to do that or not. He's the ultimate competitor. He's played a lot of football for the Gophers. A positive attitude, constantly great leader. Uh, but here's the thing. I mean, he, he's not gone. I mean, he's here. He's having surgery Wednesday. He, his leadership will be felt as we continue to go through the season. He's got big responsibilities in leading our football team still. And um, I, I know he's down right now, but he's not out. Uh, he's going to be felt on our football team uh, this entire year. Uh, but again, if football, it's not about if it happens to you, it's about how you respond to it because injuries are part of our game. Unfortunately, it's happened to us with, really some, with some really good players over the last few years. Uh, but I do know we now have a surrounding cast that can really uplift our offense. And uh, I mean, six different players caught a pass uh, last week. I think it was more the week before uh, from the tight ends to the backs to the wideouts. Everybody just has to step up their game, and I know they will. We've talked a lot about the offense. The defense has been phenomenal. You're second in the nation in total D. You were a top five defense a year ago, and yet you lost a lot. And so I think there was some curiosity as to whether or not you would be able to carry over, and, and clearly it has. What makes Joe Rossi so good? I feel like people don't talk about him in the way they talk about some of these other defensive coordinators nationally. Why is he so good? Well, they need to talk about him. Uh, agreed. And uh, once, yes. you, once you start talking about him, you're never going to stop talking about him because, uh, first of all, he's an unbelievable man, an unbelievable husband, an unbelievable father. His little boys are always out at practice with their gopher helmets on and their gloves that don't fit and just can't get enough of dad as the coach as well. Uh, but what he, he's such a phenomenal teacher uh, and educator, and he does what our defense is capable of doing and builds the schemes around that. It's not about Joe Rossi. It's about what our defense can do and can do at an elite level. And I think he's really good at that. Uh, the players love him. He's a wonderful, he's a great motivator, uh, but he's also a disciplinarian because he needs it exactly the way it needs to be. Uh, and, you know, we recruit really smart players. I, I, we believe smarter players are better players. They can do more. They can concentrate better. They can focus better. Uh, and we've got a really smart defense uh, of guys who have played a ton of football, um, but he is a special, special coach, and the world needs to take notice of Joe Rossi, win or lose. I mean, he's done it for a long time here. Coach, you mentioned needing it to be exactly the way it needs to be. You know, it's interesting. It, it kind of brings to mind a story that I read about you 
a number of years ago. I think maybe it was when you were introduced as Minnesota's coach, and it was one of your childhood friends telling a story about running a car detailing business in suburban Chicago where you guys grew <laughs> up, and that you were so detail-oriented that you would literally take Q-tips to the vents to make sure that they were perfectly clean and that it looked exactly like you wanted it to look, that it looked like new when you gave it back to the owner. How does that translate to coaching, kind of that obsession with details and, and needing it to be perfect? Yeah, first of all, that company was called Dr. Detail, and a buddy of mine in college, uh, him and I ran it, and uh, I thought I was detailed until I met my wife, Heather, and she's like 100 <laughs> times more detailed than even I am, uh, including the Q-tips into the vents. Uh, but the, but the, 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 the detail is, is everything, um, you know, especially when you're talking about there is no small things. There's no such thing as the little things. Everything is a big thing, especially when you're talking about the world of football. Um, and that's always kind of been with me because I've always been the king of the twos, too small, too short, too slow, you know, too young, uh, even as a coach, being a head coach at 32 years old. So you always had to find different ways of doing things, unique ways of doing things, but do it with all of being yourself. Uh, and we even do that with situational football, making sure every stone is turned over, looking under every stone. Because you're at a place like Minnesota, you're always looking for an edge. You're always looking for an advantage. You're always looking for something that just makes you a little bit different by just being yourself. Nobody's trying to do that. It's just you. And if you get enough people that have that, that common characteristic of being detail-oriented, um, you can do a lot of special things. And, um, you know, uh, our team is, is, is very detail-oriented. I said we would talk about Michigan State, so let's finish there. What do you see when you turn on the film and, and start looking at the Spartans? Well, first of all, they're, I, I, and this is the best compliment I can give them, they're a Mel Tucker coach football team. They're incredibly tough. They fly around. They play with passion, play with heart. They're incredibly physical, smart. Uh, they play a lot of players. They've got a lot of talent on both sides of the ball, including special teams. Uh, the quarterback's the heartbeat of the team. Um, I mean, I mean, Thorne is, is a guy that can make every throw. He can run it with his feet. Um, and then they've got big people up front. They've got tight ends that can make catches. They've got athletes galore at wide receiver uh, and, a, and a huge running back room in terms of depth of multiple transfers that can play. And defensively, I mean, he's a defensive-minded coach, so you know they're going to be sound on defense, fly around, tackle well, be tough. And their front seven shows that as well as their secondary. Um, you know, this is the first time we're going on the road, but, you know, we do everything we can to create chaotic environments, even in practice, Dave, which you've even been to numerous ones where, you know, you do that in spring ball, you do that in training camp to prepare yourself for going on the road in season. If you start preparing yourself to go on the road in season, I mean, you're already doomed. Uh, we know it's going to be a hostile environment. Got a ton of respect for Michigan State and what they do and how they do it, including their fan base. Well, PJ, we're looking forward to seeing it right here on the Big Ten Network. Congratulations on a fabulous start, and thanks a lot for taking the time to join us. Really appreciate it. Appreciate it, Dave. Roll the boat, Sky Imago Gophers. Thanks a lot. As I mentioned, we do have the Gophers on the Big Ten Network on Saturday, that huge early season showdown with Michigan State. We'll see Penn State in action early, Purdue and Northwestern both playing in primetime. Cannot wait. Back on Big Ten today, we look at the Big Ten West. Minnesota, the only team that has yet to lose. Northwestern is technically in first place, the only conference win of the bunch, but they have been dreadful since their win over Nebraska, losing to Duke and Southern Illinois. Wisconsin, Iowa, Illinois, all at two and one. And then you see the Boilermakers and the Huskers. Uh, let's dive in. We start with Minnesota. Do you see them as the best of the West? I think they've got to be right now. I mean, they're playing really, really well. And P.J. Fleck made the point, a bit, again, about some of the level of competition of some of their games. They can't help that. Colorado's a Power 5 team. They're, oh, oh, absolutely. They're not, they're no, not very no good yes. right now. But, I mean, that's as dominant as you could possibly win a game. And so I just really like what we're seeing, the balance on the offense, the balance between offense and defense on this team. We know about the schedule. They avoid Michigan. They avoid Ohio <laughs> State. Like, I think it all is all aligning for Mi Minnesota to be the favorite in the West. Yeah, I, I think without doubt right now from what we've seen, the small sample size, there's no question that they're the best team in the West. And you mentioned the balance that they show on offense and defense and special teams. They're just playing at a really high level. And Coach Rossi and that defense is really playing well, which is allowing that offense to do what they need to do. And you look, up, you look at this offensive line, everyone's replaced up, up front. And they have done a great job of bringing that offense flying together. And it helps when you have a running back that they have 
but they're just they want to be physical. That's what they wanted. That's why this game will be so fascinating with Michigan State. I think that's the thing that impresses me the most. I mean, you have John Michael Schmitz back at, at center, and other than that, you lost the entire offensive line from a group that was really, mm-hmm. really good. And then yeah. on defense, they lost a lot too, right? They went to the portal, but also they've developed players. And I, I think that's what really stands out to me is you often think that – those programs kind of are going to ebb and flow. And, well, you know, you kind of build it up, and then you're going to lose some guys, and maybe you take a, a short step back in a year to then take a, a bigger step forward the next year. That isn't what's happened. I mean, they're arguably better despite massive personnel losses. Well, and, and I just think about, like, the way that they've been hit with injuries over the years, yep. including today, right? Like, But they have been so – good at weathering those Mm -hmm. they have those guys that can step up the depth around it like we talked about the o-line last year carrying that run game with different running backs after season ending injuries like there is just a lot to like about the way that they are built as a program that they can withstand these things and so i i think that feeds into the confidence that i have in the gophers yeah they they just have figured out how to 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 get this program to a place where it's expected each and every year for them to be able to do that and that's you know, a testament to the coaching staff being able to go out and recruit and recruit the right people to buy into that system. I, I'll stand by this. When when I watched them practice, and he, Coach Fleck, talked about being able to go through different scenarios to go through the game, you don't see a better practice than when you watch the Gophers practice, the way they move from position to position. And it's just not the players. Because a lot of way, the way I look at things, too, I look at the support staff as much as I look at the coaches and players. Right. And the way the support staff moves, and I'm talking about the managers, equipment people, what, the way they move around tells you a lot about a program. They have one of the more unique practices. I get to go to yeah. some when I'm traveling along the road, and theirs is unique. The way that they do things, the way PJ does things, is different. Oh, for sure. Yeah, and I mean, I, I think back to – I just think they have a great staff. And, and, and I think he's constantly looking to improve the staff, hence you know, bringing Kirk Sharaka back because yeah. he knew – how good he could be. But I think back to that situational special teams practice mm-hmm. that we were at a year ago, and it was like a quiz, yeah. right? I mean, stop the music. Is that a live ball? What would it, what would need to happen for it to be a live ball? You know, block field goal. What, do you jump on it? Do you not like all that stuff? And everyone had to be on their toes. Everyone had to know what was going on. It, it was amazing. And so what did he say? Detail-oriented, yep, right? absolutely. The little Q-tips yeah, yeah. in the vents. Yeah, those are the Q-tips in the vents. Exactly. Yep. That's, that's where he's yep. got this program. Right absolutely. Uh, Wisconsin got a bounce-back win. Look, New Mexico State is dreadful. No doubt about that. But where are you on the Badgers now? They did what they needed to do. It was therapeutic. I think that there's, yep. there's, it's helpful to have some of those games after a, a tough stretch. I think Graham Mertz is quietly putting up some really nice numbers. Like he's doing a lot of the things that we've been waiting for him to do. Be, be really accurate. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, he's over 76% of his passes in 2022 you know he's he's piling up yardage Uh, again we don't know a ton about what that offense can do under pressure but i think you know you you were looking for signs of growth there in the passing game and not just in the run game um and then defensively I, i think you know they did what they had to do against an inferior opponent so there's not much you can take away from that but i just think the confidence and and graham mertz shoring things up being more accurate as a passer those are those are positives graham mertz is the key to the Badgers season. And yes, I know you talk about everyone else that's around, offensive line, wide receivers, or defense, but he's the key. If he can manage the game, and, and sometimes we talk about managing the game, all of a sudden you don't have talent. This, this, the, sea, the sky's the limit when you talk about the talent for Graham Mertz, there's no question. But he's got to be able to make all the right decisions, right, make the right throws, and, and Bobby Ingram's doing a really good job because, I mean, as you mentioned, he's clearly improved. So that has to continue to, to move forward but they're going to need him this coming week. I mean, we're going to find out just how much he's grown as a quarterback, as a leader this week. This is the test. I mean, because these are the games he has not played well in in his career against ranked teams. He's two and six, four touchdown passes, Mm -hmm. 11 interceptions. So we'll see how he can do against Ohio State and Ohio State defense that is certainly not on the level of its offense. I'm saying a lot. The Ohio State offense might be the best in the country, Mm -hmm. but we'll see whether they can get something against that Buckeyes D. Uh, What about Iowa? 27 points against (laughs) Nevada. So they had 14 points all season coming in. They had more yards in this game than they had had in their two previous games Mm -hmm. coming in. Again, level of competition. But, you know, let's be honest. They hadn't exactly played Murderer's Row. Certainly the first game wasn't Murderer's Row. So uh, what do we think? I mean, did, did this 
assuage some of our concerns here, or was this just an aberration? Was it just something that happens at 3 a.m.? Like, is that when the magic <laughs> when the world comes out? Watching? Yeah, when the world's We were all watching. There was yeah, a dog yeah. at the game, though. Did you guys see yeah. that? There was a dog in the stands? That was pretty great. Yeah. Um, no, I, you know, again, all of those things are positive. The, the ease in which they found the end zone, I think, was very important for Iowa to, to do and to establish and to show themselves that they can do that. We saw the healthy receivers back. Mm -hmm. That obviously was a factor. We saw them make some great plays. I thought, too, Caleb Johnson and the fact that there were two explosive plays, yes. 40 in a 55-yard run, we haven't seen something like that out of Iowa. We were talking earlier in the, in the show about explosive plays. They're mm -hmm. very important. They're very important. That's not what Iowa's had. And so I think having multiple of those, the just – the idea of breakout players offensively, I, I think that's so important. So, again, you know, th how many people watched this game? How many people endured all of the, the you know? But, again, it's, it's just – it's about progress. It's about finding guys that you can consider playmakers, who can, who can open games, who can, who can get chunk plays, that the offense works, that you can find the end zone. They were doing that. They were doing that, and I think you've got to feel good about that because it finally looked like they were complementing the defense and the special teams. And I think it really was about really having the confidence, right, in this offense because everybody was saying, uh, hey, Coach Ferentz, uh, you better make a change here at this quarterback yeah. position. This thing isn't really working out. But what, it, what it, he kept saying was it's just not the quarterback. He needs to get the pieces around him back. That happened. Right, you, you start to see guys make plays. You start to see the explosive plays out of the run game, from their offensive line played much better than they have played in the previous weeks. You you saw them starting to get up to the second level to the linebackers to be able to block there. So you saw things starting to open, and so much of that is about confidence, right? They've got to be able to prove to themselves that hey, yes, we can get it done, and not necessarily listening to the outside noise. But now they have to put that together. They have to be able to repeat. They have to continue to get better. They can't go back to a situation where they get seven points and there's two safeties in that deal. They're going to face a really good defense this week. I mean, Rutgers is yeah. hard to run mm -hmm. the ball on. They've yep. given up fewer than 100 rushing yards total this season. They are really good on D. There'll be a lot of punts. A lot of great punts. <laughs> yeah. Tori Taylor, Adam Corsak. I was hoping he was going to mention that. Right, there you go. Like, is he going to do it? Is he going to talk punts? Is he going to mention You know, punts? you can mention it if oh, I, I was don't. Just, yeah. I thought you were going to. I was waiting. I was yeah. waiting. Two yeah. great punters. Oh, you just need to empower yourself to jump in. And say, Let's talk punts, Dave. For our overreaction Monday segment, let's start with the biggest story from last week. That was, of course, Nebraska, the dismissal of Scott Frost, Mickey Joseph taken over in his first game, and they got hammered by Oklahoma 49-14. to 14. Are the Huskers as bad as they seem, Howard, or was this just tough timing given all the chaos of the week and, and the fact that they had to put together a game plan for a really good team? Yeah, I definitely don't think they're that bad, right, as they showed in this particular game. But you talk about all the adversity that they've been going through as far as the coaching change, You're going against a really good Oklahoma team, looks like. They just were not ready to get going. But uh, to tell you, talk about a bye week. They needed that to happen this week so they can kind of regroup uh, and really get their game plans together to move forward this year. Yeah, I think I think the, the concern is still defensively just how many yards they're giving up. I mean, this is an Oklahoma team that hadn't really put it on anybody. You know, they had won some games nicely and with their defense, but 580 yards of offense. Um, obviously, they made a change at the defensive coordinator position, but this is a defense that's allowing – better than 50% on third down conversions. Problem. Like that's a huge problem can't because you can't field. get off the field. Right. Exactly. And so I think that's where I'm extremely concerned still. And when you're looking for where you need to see some progress because you want to see these players get to win games and experience that growth, um, that's where you got to look. But absolutely terrible timing to have, to have this transition and to be really struggling defensively. You mentioned the defensive coordinator change again. Eric Shenander let go yesterday, mm -hmm. so uh, Bill Bush will take over as the defensive coordinator. But uh, again, I, I'm with you, Howard. I think the bye week does yeah. them a ton of good. The timing there is really good. Yeah. Chance yes. to kind of collect themselves and, and figure things out. Uh, Michigan State never really in the game at Washington. I think the final score was deceptive. They lost by 11. They were down 22 to nothing. This game, for all intents and purposes, was over. It's hard to go on the road as a Big Ten team going out to the Pac-12, and they've now lost 13 in a row in that scenario. They have won one since 1957 yeah. at Cal. Uh, is this, uh, you know, the pass defense was once again torn up. I mean, do we look at this and say they haven't gotten better in the area they needed to get better 
that secondary, or was this just, hey, it's hard to go west? Well, Michael Penix Jr. has been great. Um, I think he has been a revelation of sorts in the in, in there for Washington. He's familiar, right? He, yep, he's, no doubt. He's played Michigan State in his past events. But, no, I'm prepared to stay overreacting to just, you know, how concerned I am about that past defense. This is the seventh time in 14 games that they gave up 350 yards or more offensively um, in the air. And so, I, like, that's a problem. I, I mean, we spent the whole offseason looking for them to shore that up. And you can get pressure on the quarterback. You can do other things, mm -hmm. but you're going to need to figure that out because this isn't how Mel Tucker wants to win games. He doesn't want to be in these positions. You know, this is where they need to grow, and it's costing them, and it cost them in moments last year. It, it created a situation where, like, this game just wasn't close because, you know, Michael Penix Jr. was able to do what he wanted, I, and that's that's the problem. Like, you, you got to have a defense that can keep you in a game when you're when you're – fall behind early. It's hard when you have these mobile quarterbacks that can throw the ball vertically down the field to try to keep them in front of you because they can make plays not only just with their arms but with their legs as well. But I thought for Michigan State to have an opportunity to win this game on the road, they would need to be able to win the line of scrimmage and be able to run the football. That they weren't able to do. So they were kind of put in a situation where they had to sit back and try to throw it because they were out, you know, because of the score, they had to throw it, but also they couldn't get the run game going. So I think this is a team, when you talk about the toughness that they have, it's about being able to run the football. And if they can't do that when they need to on a consistent basis, it puts way too much pressure on the pass game that doesn't have the best wide receiver travel to Washington. Right. Hopefully they'll get him back this week and read, but they've got to figure out how to make some plays uh, and put points on the board. And on defense, one of the things that they've hung their hat on is – forcing teams to make mistakes, to make yeah. tough decisions, right? But you had no sacks, they had one tackle for loss, and they didn't force any turnovers. They were leading the nation in sacks, were leading the Big Ten in tackles yeah. for loss and forced turnovers, didn't get any of it, and hence, you know, you don't get pressure on the quarterback, and, and you're going to give up a, a lot of yards to a good QB. Uh, Purdue really gave away a game at Syracuse. They took the lead in the final minute. They got two unsportsmanlike conduct penalties after that go-ahead touchdown, including one on head coach Jeff Brom. Is this cataclysmic to lose that game, or is this just the kind of thing that happens against what is, a, it appears, a very good Syracuse team? Yeah, Syracuse is better. Um, I know that, like, on paper, we're like, oh, you know, a loss to Syracuse is, is problematic. Right. But, but the thing is, I think it's the way that they lost. Like, that's where everyone's concerned about. I mean, because, again, you, you just lost a heartbreaker to Penn State. Yeah. This one was so self-inflicted that I think that's where you're so concerned because in that final drive for Syracuse that won them the game, I think it was 25 yards that they actually accounted for and the rest was penalty yardage. Yeah. And obviously they got that return that, that uh, Purdue had to kick off from the 10-yard line. You had the bad pick six, but it was really those penalties because you should still win that game in that situation. I think that's what's really frustrating, and and that's on the coaching staff. And you know there was one penalty directly on Jeff Brom, but like you, you can't be that undisciplined in that situation on the road in a game that you really need to win. So I think that's where the frustration is around this program. It, it's the way that they lost that game. They should not have lost that game. And now this is two games they shouldn't have lost in a certain way. Listen, Penn State had a lot to do with why they weren't able to to make plays, but they weren't tackling well in that game those are things that you have to be able to take care of but when you think about it and you just mentioned it the lack of discipline when it counted they're not in a position where they can just have these can nobody really is that you can give up what was it close to 50 yards and penalties on the last drive and it, you just can't play the game that way and expect to have success and what's difficult is when you go back and you look I'm saying from a coaching staff and a, a player standpoint and you're a fan of Purdue you're looking at these games and you're like, well, wait a minute, all we need to do is make some tackles against Penn State and, and we win the game. I mean, the atmosphere, everything was great. And then we have all these penalties, the, the lack of discipline there. They, so that's problematic, something that they need to get fixed. And losing close games has been a thread that's kind of run through this program, unfortunately, 11 and 18 mm -hmm. in one score games now under Jeff Brom. I do want to go positive with one of these. Uh, <laughs> let's go with Maryland. This was a tricky game against SMU. Uh, the Mustangs can really throw it around, and they had the lead in the fourth quarter. Maryland scores two fourth-quarter touchdowns to win the game. Do we feel like Maryland has turned a corner here, winning a game like that with its back up against the wall? 
Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think this is an SMU program that's been one of the better group of five programs and has knocked off power five opponents. I mean, this was a good win, and I think the way that they won it, too, was really impressive. Some defensive stops mm -hmm. there late, and then the offense coming through. I, I just think they learned something about themselves and what they need to do to pull out a game like this, and it was an important step. The defense was stressed in this game because of the amount of plays that they had to go out and play, just because of the pace that SMU plays at. They were put in some tough situations, but as you mentioned, they were able to come up with some big plays to slow them down at the end, and then offensively, we know they can score points, but defense is where it all starts for them. And they did a great job when push came to shove in the red zone, right? And they mm -hmm. gave up just two touchdowns in six red zone trips for SMU. So yeah, a ton of yards, well over 500 yards for the Mustangs, but again, it comes down to what you do when your back's up against yep. the wall, up yep. against your own goal line, and, and really did a nice job there. Uh, the